Hi everyone, uh, my name is Mark and welcome to my latest video which I've entitled EVs for Beginners. Um, now for those of you who've followed the channel for a while, um, you'll know a little bit about the background. Um, we basically started researching EVs about nine months ago um, when we were thinking of changing our car. Um, we ended up buying our first EV six months ago, um, shortly followed by replacing our second car with an EV as well because we like the first one so much. Um, and then along the way, what we were doing was documenting uh, our, our learning and our experiences um, for people to sort of follow our journey. Um, now, what we decided to do today is basically try and recap all of those videos into one, um, because there's a lot of stuff to watch um, and uh, some of it's a little bit outdated now. And so we thought it'd probably be easier to sort of recap it all into one video. And although it's a longer video, there's a lot of content in here for you. Uh, some of it for experienced people, you'll you'll understand and know all this sort of stuff every, uh, already. Um, but if you're brand new to EVs, um, then a lot of this will be new to you and hopefully will help demystify um, the whole process of choosing an EV uh, and looking at things like charging and journey planning. So, so with that further ado, let's have a quick look at what we're going to cover. Um, so the first is we're going to talk about the cars themselves. So we're going to talk about the different types of EV, uh, the cost of them and the savings in running one. Uh, we'll talk about batteries and talk about the size of batteries and the range that you're going to get. Um, we'll look at home charging um, and we'll talk about the grants that are available. Uh, also about how that gets installed and then how you can best exploit having your home charger by getting a good energy tariff. Um, we'll then look at public charging. So we'll look at the different types of connectors because again um, there are different connector types depending on the type of car that you've got. Uh, we'll talk about the speed of charging uh, and then we'll talk about the different providers for uh, charge points and things like memberships for instance. And then finally what we'll do is we'll wrap up by looking at journey planning. Uh, we'll look at some of the apps that are out there um, and a few top tips uh, along the way, uh, really from our experience. Um, by all means, I'm no expert on this. Um, technically, I'm not an expert, uh, but this is just all the sort of stuff that we've found along the way. And it's sort of become second nature to us now, things that we don't think about. And I think that's the thing to remember with, you know, when you had your first car, uh, and you learned to drive for the very first time and you had to learn how to use a gearbox and then you had to, when you passed your test, go and fill up for the first time and work out how to use a petrol pump. Um, and all of those sorts of things, you just take them for granted now. But once upon a time, you learn how to do stuff in a petrol car. And that's really what this video is all about. It's how to learn how to do the stuff with uh, an EV. So without further ado, we'll make a start and we'll have a look at cars, uh, looking at the types of cars, the costs and the savings that are associated. Um, so really there's three main types of electric vehicle um, and the first is a self-charging hybrid. So what we're looking at here is a car that's got both an electric engine and a petrol engine, uh, which also means it's got a fuel tank and it's got a battery. Um, in this particular case, being a self-charging hybrid, uh, it doesn't plug into a charger. Um, it basically charges the battery when you drive it around with the petrol engine uh, to give you better efficiency. Um, the downside with these cars, of course, is from an electric point of view at least, uh, you have a limited range because you don't have a very big battery in them uh, because you've got all the, uh, the petrol gubbins in there as well. So there, there's obviously a variety of self-charging hybrids out there. Um, the second type of car is what we call a plug-in hybrid. So again, very similar to the previous car, um, but the fact that it's a plug-in, it means you can actually plug it into a charger and charge it up in, in advance um, and then literally drive straight away on electric uh, for a while. And then when that runs out, obviously the petrol engine can kick in and start to top it back up again. Uh, again, smaller batteries in these uh, and uh, a limited range. And again, obviously there's lots of different types of uh, plug-in hybrids available. Um, now our cars are fully electric and then again, personal preference of mine is to go fully electric. Um, we really haven't had any issues with uh, charging. So I don't really get the point of a plug-in hybrid. I know some people like them because they're nervous uh, about range and, and like to have the backup of a petrol engine should they get into trouble. Uh, we've not experienced that. We've done some re reasonably adventurous journeys with, with our car. 
Um, I know some of the people who drive plug-in hybrids and, and um, self-charging hybrids are company car drivers. Uh, and one of the reasons they've gone down that route is because uh, the tax breaks uh, for the tax allowances for having a company car, which is uh, partially electric, um, doesn't necessarily mean they're using the electric features of it at all. Um, but, uh, you know, that does happen. Uh, but most of the things we're going to talk about today are about fully electric, because that's where our experience lies. So um, it's only got an electric motor, it's got a bigger battery, um, you need to plug it in to charge it. <coughs> All of the range that you're going to get <coughs> is from the electricity. <coughs> and of course, the other thing about it, these are the cheapest cars to run um, because you're certainly not having to put any petrol into it or any diesel. Uh, and also the things like servicing costs are cheaper as well. Uh, and then of course, obviously any savings you get with uh, road tax and those sorts of things. Um, so let's talk about costs. Um, and, and I did this in a, uh, an earlier video and that's where I've tried to compare two pretty much identical cars so we could get a true uh, comparison. So in this particular case, where I've done this time is chosen the Corsa uh, and I've chosen the Corsa SRI. Uh, I think the uh, electric is a little bit more advanced because it's got the NAV premium stuff on it as well. Uh, but they're very close in specification car wise. And what you can see is the one on the left, that's petrol. Um, I've given it an automatic gearbox because that's what you get with an electric car. And, and that just helps me come do a, a like for like comparison. Uh, and then over on the right hand side, what we've got is a Corsa with a 50 kilowatt hour battery. I'll explain more about that later when we talk about batteries. Um, just looking at the prices, um, I've done both of these as an example as a PCP. Uh, again, I know a lot of people who are buying electrics are um, nervous about the technology and how fast it's advancing. So a lot of people who are leasing these cars or doing PCPs rather than buying them outright. Um, we did that with our first car. Uh, with our second one, we actually bought it outright because I think we're reasonably confident with the car and um, think there'll obviously be a demand for it when we come to change it in the future. So we've got one on a PCP, one that we purchased. Uh, but you can see the difference in the price. Um, the uh, electric car is £5,000 more. And then if we look at the monthly PCP, and this is 48 months, so it's a four-year PCP, uh, you can see the difference in the purchase uh, in the monthly price is 284 against 313. So actually, when you come down to the electric, is only 30 pounds a month more uh, for the electric car. Now, both of these cars have a 10% deposit down, um, so there is another 500 pounds to pay uh, on the deposit. So 2,000 against two and a half thousand. So you're looking at 500 pound down extra, uh, and then just 30 pounds a month uh, for having the electric version of the same car. So Obviously, different cars, different specifications, um, but I just felt it was a good idea to do a like for like comparison, two cars that are pretty much the same. So you can get some sort of idea of price differentials. But let's talk about the savings. Um, so the car's a little bit more expensive per month. It's a little bit more to outlay. Um, first thing is the government grant. Uh, you're probably aware that there is a government grant for people who buy an EV. Um, now at the moment that's now only on cars up to 35,000, which is one of the reasons why I chose the Corsa. Um, and I would imagine that two and a half thousand is included in the prices that we've been quoted there. Um, if you go above 35,000, you don't get the grant, so the car will be more expensive. Uh, a couple of other things on savings wise is car tax. Uh, again, uh, an internal combustion engine car, petrol or diesel, uh, we call these ICE cars. Um, the car tax can be all sorts of different prices from, I don't know, from £30 to cars over £40,000. Um, you know, you add another £350 a year onto the, the car tax just because of the value of the car. So the, the saving, you know, car tax could be quite big because at the moment, electric cars, car tax is zero uh, for now. Um, I'm sure that's not going to last. At some point, the government are going to have to start to charging some sort of car tax on electric cars because the roads have still got to be paid for and maintained. And at the moment, we're not paying any car, any car tax and we're also not paying any uh, duty on our fuel that we're buying. So there's a big hole in the revenue at the moment that I'm sure they're going to have to plug that gap at some point in the future. Um, the other savings is on servicing. Um, now we've looked at three types of cars. We looked at uh, a normal combustion engine car, petrol or diesel. Uh, we looked at hybrids and we looked at electric. Um, 
the expensive ones would obviously be a petrol or a diesel car because um, you've got a petrol engine in there with oil filters, oil changes, spark plugs, fan belts, all that sort of stuff going on uh, that needs to be uh, serviced. Uh, but actually a hybrid would be more expensive to service because not only have you got the petrol engine, you've also got an electric engine. So actually the car is more complex. So that will be the most expensive from a, a servicing point of view. Um, cheapest ones to service obviously are electrics, as, uh, although they're quite complex in the electrics and the powertrain and all those sorts of things. You know, it doesn't have a gearbox. Um, you know, it doesn't have a petrol motor with all the mechanics that go with that. It's just an electric motor. So servicing electric vehicles is the cheapest way. So there'll be a cost saving there as well. But the big saving is obviously on fuel. And let's just do a couple of examples. Now, for the two cars that I looked at um, for pricing wise, I, I worked on 12,000 miles a year. And, and obviously you can do your own maths on this depending on how many miles that you do. Um, so we're looking now for four years, 48,000 miles. Um, and I've taken an example of say 40 miles a gallon um, on a petrol car. That means you need 1,200 gallons uh, over four years. And that works out at the moment £6.14 a gallon if you work on 135 a litre. Um, so the petrol cost for 48,000 miles is £7,300 over four years. If we look at the electric car, uh, again, same mileage. Um, but what we do with electric cars, we don't do miles per gallon. We do miles per kilowatt hour. And again, we'll talk about kilowatt hours when we look at the battery in a minute. Um, an average for an EV is probably about three and a half miles per kilowatt hour. So we need to um, charge the car with 13,714 kilowatts of energy from plugging it into something. And my tariff at the moment is uh, five and a half pence per kilowatt hour. And again, a bit later, I'll talk about tariffs and how I've got that so cheap, um, because there are some tricks that you can do there to get cheaper energy. Um, but that is working at 754 pounds to charge the car for three, four years, for 48,000 miles, which is absolutely nothing. It's less than 200 pound a year in charging. Um, now, if you use public chargers, that will be more expensive because you won't get five and a half P to the public charger. Um, so obviously it would probably work out a little bit more than that when you've got your public chargers. But but if I was to charge it at home, uh, five and a half P a kilowatt hour, um, I was talking about 6,600 pounds saving across four years. Um, and if you take all of that into account, that more than offsets the additional cost of the car. Um, I think the thing about it as well, if you think of buying an electric car, um, obviously what you'll do is when you sell it, you will sell it for more than the petrol car. So again, you might buy it for more money, but you'll sell it for more money because you'll be selling it with a battery and with charging it. So that gives you some sort of ideas on some numbers uh, as an example. So let, let's talk about the battery um, and talk about the size of the battery and about the sort of range that you can expect. Uh, again, what I've done is I've picked three random cars of different sizes. Uh, so we've gone for the uh, Mini Electric uh, with the Peugeot E2008, which is one of the cars that we've got, uh, and then a Tesla Model 3 Long Range. Um, and then if we look at the three batteries, so the Mini has got a 28.9 kilowatt hour battery. Um, so what that basically means is if you were to charge it from empty, you'd need to put 28.9 kilowatts of energy from the grid in, into the car. Uh, the Peugeot is 45 and the Tesla is 70. And no surprise is that the range is different for each one because of the size of the battery. So again, um, in this example, uh, the Mini, it says uh, averaging 115 miles, the Peugeot 155 miles and the Tesla 280 miles. Now, this data is not come from the manufacturer's websites. This has come from uh, a really useful website called ev-database.uk. Well worth looking at if you're researching EVs. There's some amazing information on there, and I'll show you a little bit more on that in a minute, because these ranges that you see here are not what you'll get when you look at the manufacturer's website. These are a lot more realistic. What you'll get on the manufacturer's website is what's called an, a WLTP range. And it's uh, a new standard for, um, you know, sort of ranges of cars, not just electric cars, but also for petrol cars. And it's all about fuel consumption, that sort of thing. Um, so it stands for World Harmonised Light Vehicle Test Procedure, um, supposedly based on real driving data. I would ignore the 
WLTP range figures with, and then just take the whole thing with a pinch of salt because they're not realistic at all. It's very complex on working out what the range is of an EV and you can't just give a simple number on that. And let's show you what I mean by that because again, if we go back to the EV database website, here you'll see the differences in the ranges. So the Mini, we're talking of a range between 80 and 175 miles. Um, the Peugeot between 105 and 235 and the Tesla between 200 and 405. So sort of double range, uh, you know, and that's really quite weird. The thing you'll notice when you look at this, there's two factors to take into account here. Um, the first is whether you're driving in a city or whether you're driving on a highway. And again, this is where EVs are the completely opposite to a petrol or a diesel car. Um, a petrol car is very inefficient driving around town with all the stopping and starting, but it's a lot more efficient cruising at, say, 60 miles an hour on a motorway, for instance. You'll get a much better mile per gallon on a long journey on a motorway. EVs are completely the opposite. You'll notice that on a highway, so fast driving without any braking, just continually driving, you get a much lower uh, mileage than if you were driving around a city with a lot of stopping and starting. So I actually flip it on its head um, and you just have to think a little bit differently about mile per gallon in that way. The other thing that affects an EV is the temperature. And that's basically because batteries don't perform so well when they're cold. So in the winter, your range will go down compared to what you're getting in the summer. Um, and that's why uh, the WLTP rating is just to be ignored really. What you really need to look at this and look at the type of car that you're buying, look at the profile of the driving that you do and find something that's got a range that's suitable for you. Um, but as you can see, there's quite a lot of factors to take into account and you definitely need to think differently about um, how much range you're gonna get out of a car on the journey. Completely the opposite to a petrol car, the way it works. Um, now the thing about driving in a city is why why is it more efficient driving in a city well well there's a couple of reasons but the, the main reason is what they call regenerative braking um, and what we're looking at here is when you slow down in the car and you take your foot off the accelerator um, you don't necessarily have to touch the brake um, you can just take your foot off the accelerator and you'll feel the car slowing down automatically on its own and what it's doing, it's basically reversing the energy of the forward motion of the car and feeding that back into the battery. So it's using the braking of the car to slow it down, but also to add charge back into the car. So if you drive around in a city centre and it's stop, start, stop, start, if you switch on regenerative braking, then you will firstly add more energy into your car. And secondly, you'll get much, much better range. Uh, the other thing, of course, when you pull up a set of traffic lights, the car just switches off and doesn't use any power at all. Um, I once had a, a conversation with a London black cab driver who was driving uh, one of the new electric black cabs. And I asked him about how he got on working a full shift in a, in a black cab. And, and he basically said, I, I can do a full shift on one charge. Uh, I don't have to charge during the day. Uh, basically, I'm stopping and starting all day long and the car will last me all day. Um, and that's the big, big difference. We, we found it um, in one of our previous videos when we went down to Bournemouth and the Isle of Wight. Um, we were finding that on some of our journeys, we'd start out and we'd got X number of miles of range. And when we got to the end of our journey, we'd actually got more range and we'd actually put more energy into the car than we'd used on the journey. Um, so it's, again, completely different way uh, of thinking. So how do you get the charge into the car in the first place? Uh, well, let's start with home charging, first of all. Now, the, the thing about home charging is um, I wouldn't recommend, at the moment, I wouldn't recommend an electric vehicle for someone who cannot charge at home. Um, so if you don't have a drive or a garage that you can park your car in and plug your car into a charger, uh, if you've got a park on the street, uh, personally, at the moment, I wouldn't recommend an electric vehicle. The infrastructure isn't in place at the moment for um, people who can't charge at home. Um, some cities are doing a good job of this. London, obviously, as you can imagine, has done a lot on this. They've got masses of chargers. And, and surprisingly, one that I found on a journey, uh, again, did a video on this a while ago, was Coventry, uh, where a lot of the lampposts and bollards have been converted into chargers uh, in streets and people can plug in outside their home. Um, but what I would suggest is obviously the first thing you need to do is get yourself a home charger fitted. 
Now, again, you may be aware of this, but there is a government grant for uh, getting a home charger fitted. Um, covers up to 75% of the cost, up to £350. Um, what you will find is if you're buying an EV from new, your dealer will probably help you get this sorted. Um, and in fact, when we bought our first EV, um, not only did we get the grant off the government, but also the uh, dealer put some money into the pot as well to help pay for the charger. I think it cost us about 150 quid in total by the time it was all done. Um, so um, uh, you, you can apply for this grant yourselves if you're gonna get a charger fitted independently. Again, if you do a Google search, there's loads of people out there fitting chargers. Um, so what happens when you do it? Well, in, in our case, the dealer that we used, they uh, worked with a company called Podpoint for doing their chargers. Um, so when we ordered the car, um, they gave us the link to contact Podpoint. Uh, we filled a load of details in online. They then asked us for some photographs of our, um, our mains box and also the path and the route to where we wanted the chargers to be fitted. They checked all the photographs out and said, yeah, that's fine, we can do all of that. And then a couple of weeks later, they came and installed the charger. So there's a lot of extra electronics in our fuse box now, um, not fuse box, but the mains box. Um, not only for that, but also for the smart meter, which we'll call, talk about in a minute. Um, but then obviously they, they then fitted the pod point as well. Uh, but that was done in a couple of weeks after we, we ordered it. Again, not sure what the lead time is. You might need to make sure you allow plenty of time to get this fitted as well. So let's talk about energy tariffs. Um, and you probably remember in my uh, maths example earlier, I was talking about five and a half P a kilowatt hour for um, uh, how much I'm paying for energy. Now, if you check your electricity bill at the moment, you will find you're probably paying a hell of a lot more than five and a half P um, for your energy per kilowatt hour. If you go and look at electricity, blah, look, see what you're paying. Um, and the reason I'm only paying 5.5p is because we are on one of the experimental tariffs for EV users. And most energy companies are doing these, but they're very tricky to find on their websites. Um, now, again, I can only really talk about the Octopus ones because I did a lot of research at the time, sort of six, nine months ago, and obviously things change, so this may not be the best deal at the moment. But certainly my understanding is that Octopus are the ones that are probably the most EV friendly with their tariffs. So first thing you needed to do was uh, I needed to switch to Octopus. Um, and you can't go onto one of their EV tariffs immediately because you need a smart meter installed. So I, I switched to Octopus um, and went onto their standard tariff. I then asked them to get me a smart meter because you need that because it needs to know what time of day uh, you're using your energy. And then once the smart meter was installed uh, and they were successfully getting readings from it, I then just phoned them up and said, I want to move on to one of your EV tariffs. Now at the time I moved on to Octopus Go. Um, and as you can see from the screenshot there, uh, basically that gives you four hours of cheap energy from half past midnight till 4.30. Um, and that was 5p a kilowatt hour. Um, somebody who watched one of my videos then came back and said, did you know about the Go Faster tariff? I was like, no, I hadn't heard about that one. And they said, ah, that one gives you five hours of charging, uh, five hours of cheap energy, a little bit more expensive, five and a half P, half P here, there's nothing, um, but you do get an extra hour of cheap energy as well. Um, and the other benefit with that, you can actually choose the start time within reason. They normally start at 8.30 in the evening, and then give you a, a time slot that you can choose it to start from from there. Uh, we went for 8.30, which means that if we want to do the tumble drying of any washing, um, we can actually tumble dry at 8.30 in the evening um, and again get uh, the tumble dryer running at 5.5p as well. So savings there as well. Um, one thing to mention about that is uh, when you plug your car in at home, um, there's normally a button you can press and put a timer on so it doesn't start charging immediately. So what happens is uh, we come home after a day out, we pull the car onto the drive, plug it in, press the timer button, and then go inside and go and have our tea and forget about it. And then at 8.30, the car goes into charge mode and it charges until it's full. Um, and again, if you've not got the car running all the way down to empty, we can pretty much most of the time fully charge our car at the five and a half P rate, which is how it works. 
Um, I will mention referral codes. Um, so uh, one thing that Octopus do is when you join up, they give you a referral code that you can give to friends and family, for instance. And if somebody uses that referral code, you both get £50 each. And I've worked that out to be 50 quid buys you about 3,000 miles in your car for nothing. Um, so if you've got a friend or somebody you know who's got Octopus as their energy provider, have a chat to them, ask them for their referral code. Um, if you don't know anybody who's got it, please feel free to use the referral code at the bottom of the screen there. Um, I'll put it into the comments as well so you can copy and paste it. Uh, but if you do that, you get 50 quid, I get 50 quid and we both get 3,000 miles of free driving. Um, it, it's an absolute no-brainer. And uh, then, of course, you can share your code with your friends when you tell them about it and do the same. Um, this one's an interesting one. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of these. It's called plunge price tariffs. I've not been brave enough to try this, but a lot of people, be, you'll find videos about this on the internet, um, well worth looking at. And that's basically where companies who use renewable energy, uh, which is another reason why I chose Octopus, because all their energy is renewable, um, they can't control the supply of the energy because they can't switch it off like a power station. So when they get very sunny days and they're getting lots of solar energy or very windy days when the wind turbines are generating loads, They've often got more energy than their customers need. So what they do is they do this thing called plunge pricing, where if you sign off to their um, agile tariff, what you'll do is you'll get a message to say that the prices are going to be really low for the next couple of hours. And you can basically plug your car in or charge it while it's even cheaper. And when I'm talking cheap, I'm talking even cheaper than five and a half P. I'm even talking negative prices. Um, so what we mean by negative prices is basically you plug the car in and charge it and they give you money for charging your car and taking the energy off their hands. Well worth researching if you've got the flexibility to do that sort of thing. Um, I, I really don't want to get constrained by having to sort of watch what the prices are at what point in time. I'm quite happy with 5.5p, it don't cost me a lot to charge the car. Um, but again, if you want to play the game, um, uh, plunge price tariffs are really quite interesting to take a look at. So that moves us on to public charging and the, we're into the realms now of all the different connectors and the different speeds of charging and the different providers and do you need to be a member with them and that sort of stuff. So um, so let's just talk about the, the connectors first of all. Now, depending on the car that you buy, depends on what type of connector you're going to get. Um, so there's three main types. There's one called a CCS, there's type two and there's a CHAdeMO. Um, most cars these days uh, have got CCS connectors and then they also have a little flap that you can pull off. If you look at the picture on the right, that's that's from uh, our Vauxhall Mocha. Um, and that little flap allows us to then plug in a CCS charger as well. So we can use CCS or Type 2 uh, in our car. And when you look at a, a charge point uh, online to see what it can do, it'll list the types of connectors that it's got and also how fast those connectors are. Um, it's worth mentioning Chadamo is mainly found in Japanese cars like uh, Nissans, Mitsubishis, that sort of thing. So let's talk about the speed of the chargers. So let, let's start with a home charger. Um, so the pod point one that you saw earlier that we had fitted, um, that's a seven kilowatt charger. So what that means is in one hour, it will put seven kilowatts of energy into my battery. So if you had, say, the Mini, which was a 28 kilowatt battery, it would you need four hours to put four times seven into that battery, 28 uh, kilowatts. Um, you can charge on a th three pin plug. Um, this is what's often called a granny charger. Um, and you get a special cable that will allow you to plug your car into a three pin plug. Um, they're not recommended for regular use, but again, um, somebody who watched one of my videos or um, said that they've always used one and never had any issues. Um, we did look at buying a granny charger cable, but when we saw the price, it was like, mm, do, do we, are we really going to get the use out of it? And so far, we've never had an issue with charging, so we've never, we would never need to use it. So we, we've not done, gone down that route. But public chargers can be a wide range of speeds. So some of the slow, slowest ones are at three kilowatts. So they're actually half the speed of my home charger. Um, and then normally the ones that you find on lampposts and bollards um, in public roads. So you can park your car and plug it in and leave it overnight plugged into a lamppost. 
Uh, again, that's the sort of thing you see in London and places like Coventry. Um, at the other extreme, some of the new chargers, the really, really fast chargers, 350 kilowatts. Um, now that's 50 times faster than my home charger, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, the speed in which you can pump energy into your car is crazy. Um, don't need to be a rocket scientist scientist to realise that not all cars can take a charge of that speed. Um, so we'll look at that in a little while and see where we could get away with that. But this is the future. At some point, most cars will be able to take things like 350 kilowatts and charge most of it in, in minutes. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, but the chargers are starting to be uh, installed. Um, but when it comes to public charging, I, personally, I would suggest looking for chargers of 50 kilowatts or above. Um, so that's still what about eight times faster than my charger at home and uh, uh, what we find with those is we can plug in a, to a 50 kilowatt charger and we can get a really good top up on our car in in 30 minutes uh, and we'll talk about how we use those 30 minutes in, in a little while so again let's just look at an example um, in this case we're going to look at uh, a mocha uh, which is one of the cars that we've got uh, you can see here it's got a 50 kilowatt hour battery and you can see that they reckon you can charge up to 80% in 30 minutes if you've got a 100 kilowatt charger. So just do the maths on that show you how it works. So the battery is 50 kilowatts, the speed is 100. So if we take 50 divided by 100, that's where your half hour comes from. Um, now, the, in reality, you can't fully charge uh, in 30 minutes. Uh, and that's because when you get to 80%, the charge slows down to protect the battery. So you can get up to 80% at full speed and then it will start to gradually slow down. 80 to 90% is a bit slower, above 90% slower still. Um, so often we, we unplug at 80% and, and move on uh, rather than wait for it to fully top up. Um, and again, we often don't charge from empty. Um, we're not that brave to drive around with hardly any charge in the car. Um, so we can normally, you know, get to say about 40% up to 80% in 30 minutes quite comfortably on a 50 kilowatt charger. Um, again, just another example, if we look at Tesla, um, you're probably aware that Tesla have their own charging network. Um, we can't use those. You've got to have a Tesla car to be able to use a Tesla charger. But Tesla drivers can use our chargers, so they get double bubble on that. And, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of people buy Teslas. Uh, because they've got the most mature charging network uh, and all fair play to them for making the investment in that to make it all possible uh, to really force the industry on. Uh, but again, in this example, um, we're looking at Model 3 and basically saying they can put 172 miles into the car in 15 minutes on one of their superchargers. Um, and, you know, it takes you five minutes to fill a car up with petrol. So for 15 minutes, 172 and, and much, much cheaper than using petrol. Uh, so when you use public chargers for the first time, you're going to see some familiar names, and some new names that you won't recognise. Uh, again, this is just like using petrol stations. You know, we've obviously got BP and Shell, uh, which you all know. Uh, obviously, if it's petrol, we'll be looking at Texaco and Esso and all those sorts of things. Uh, when you get into electric charging, got some different names in there. People like Instavolt, Genie Point, Podpoint, who do the home chargers as well. And then Ecotricity and Grid Serve, and there's a bit of a story there. Um, but what you can see here is BP and Shell have started investing in a uh, charging network. Uh, they obviously know the writings on the wall for petrol stations, and that's uh, a lot of their revenue gone. So what they're doing is diversifying into um, uh, electric charging as well. Um, and to be honest, any uh, current petrol station uh, business that isn't doing that, they must need their head looking because in a few years they're really going to start to struggle. Um, the prices of these vary massively, um, not just by provider, um, but also the main thing is depends on the charge speed. So the faster that it can charge, the more expensive they'll charge you for the energy, for the convenience of the speed. Um, so slow chargers will be a lot cheaper than very, very fast chargers. Um, now, at the moment, any new chargers that are installed have to accept um, contactless payment. Uh, the government dictated that a couple of years ago. So all the new chargers will allow you to do contactless, uh, but some of the older chargers, um, you might need to register with their app and have their app on your phone. Um, so most of these will have an app which shows you where their chargers are. 
um, and also allows you to log on and, and charge. Now, some of them also have the options of becoming members with them. And uh, BP Pulse is an interesting one because uh, BP Pulse, often you get a three month trial, either through your car dealer or direct through their website, um, to trial being a member with BP Pulse. Um, and the benefits of being a member is the uh, charges are much cheaper because you're a member. And actually it's a lot easier to charge because we've got a little RFID tag uh, that we just tap and it logs us in and then just credits our account with a charge. And uh, we've been using it on trial for the, the summer because uh, we've got quite a few holidays. So we knew we were gonna use public charges. Um, but to be honest, it's seven pound a month. And I think we're gonna pay that going forward because uh, we found it very convenient and the charge rates are cheaper. Um, and I'll probably be doing uh, you know, a fair few miles with uh, business travel going forward. Um, it's also worth mentioning Ecotricity and GridServe. Um, so e Ecotricity was the first um, company to try and put a network of chargers in the UK uh, about 10 years ago. And to be honest, they've got a really bad name. Um, we've had issues with their chargers not working and being faulty and not being as fast as they say they are. Um, and to the point where most people these days don't try, charge on motorway service stations or, or on A road service stations because Ecotricity had the monopoly on those. Um, but it's worth mentioning that they've now been bought by GridServe. Um, they do 100% renewable energy and um, GridServe are doing an amazing job of basically rebuilding the trunk road infrastructure in the UK. So when you actually go online and look at a charger on a service station, if it says Ecotricity, I'd be cautious. If it says GridServe, I'd be confident. Um, and uh, again, they're one of the people who are doing these really super fast chargers, 350 kilowatt chargers and stuff like that, as you'll see later. So finally, let's just talk about journey planning um, and the apps for planning your journey and uh, again, a few top tips. Um, so there's a couple of different apps. There's um, a WhatsApp app, uh, which is uh, again, uh, uh, tells you where the chargers are and you can put a route in and tell you what type of chargers there are. Probably the most popular one is something called ZapMap. Um, this is from the website, but you get it on uh, Android and iOS as well. Uh, this is a must have on your phone. Um, and again, what you can do is you can search an area and it will show you all of the chargers. And then you can do all sorts of filters by different types of connector, by payment methods, etc. Um, and as a rule of thumb, what they do is they the pins show you the speed of the chargers. So uh, the yellow ones are the really slow three kilowatt ones that I mentioned earlier. So those are probably Lampos or Bollards. Uh, the blue ones are typically seven kilowatts. So they're as fast as your home charger. Uh, but again, they're no good really for public charging because you need to plug in overnight to use one of those. And, and typically you can't do that. So what you're looking is for the pink ones. And these are the rapid chargers. And these really go from 22 kilowatts up to 350 kilowatts in speed. And then when you click on the pin, it'll tell you what they are. Um, notice at the bottom of recent addition is the hydrogen chargers as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about whether hydrogen is a future for, um, you know, carbon free driving. Um, and I've actually started to see uh, hydrogen pins appearing on the map in places. Uh, you can't really buy a car that uses them at the moment, but they are starting to put some hydrogen um, filling stations in. Um, so uh, we'll see how that goes over the years. And what you can do on ZapMap is you can plan your route and then you can ask it to show you the charges that within a certain radius of your route and then you can try and work out where you want to charge. Um, in my previous video, I was looking at going to a uh, holiday in Norfolk. So I thought I'd use the same route and just show you how I use that map uh, to do that. So we were going from East Ruston, which is almost on the coast um, to the east of Norwich. And we were coming back to our house, which is uh, near Litchfield. Now, um, you can put in a, an estimated range of your vehicle and then it, you know, you can get it to suggest which chargers you, sh you should use. Um, but to be honest, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to have a look at where all the chargers were and then basically in my head work out where it was safe to charge without you know, getting too low. My target was to try and get to um, the M6, uh, to the rugby services uh, and the grid surf chargers there. 
And I mentioned GridServe earlier about how they're improving the grid. Um, they've got this new um, brand called the Electric Highway. And this you can see here is a 350 kilowatt charger and that's on the M6 at Rugby. Um, so the case was, could I get from East Ruston to Rugby on a single charge? And the answer was yes. And where I did it was basically the tortoise and the hare syndrome. Um, now, when I say tortoise, I wasn't really going that slow. Uh, most of the journey was on uh, A roads, so um, and dual carriageways. So I was doing between 60 and 70 miles an hour most of the time, probably nearer 60 than 70, because I was trying to uh, make sure I've got enough range. Uh, you can see on there the route was 148 miles. Um, I've got another seven miles to add onto that because I also had to go and charge uh, the previous night uh, nearby. So actually that was 155 miles journey and I got to Rugby with 20 miles left. So that was, uh, I would say 175 miles was the range on my Mokka, which uh, is supposedly got a 200 mile range. Uh, but on A roads and motorways to get 175, very, very pleased with that. Um, the way I did it was using eco driving. So uh, put it into eco mode. So uh, reduced the power a little bit. And also I've got regen braking switched on to try and uh, recharge the battery as we slow down. Um, but the other thing that's worth mentioning is what we call bladder versus battery. Um, and uh, basically it's, can you, what lasts longer, the battery on the car or your bladder? And in my case, it was the, uh, the battery lasted longer than my bladder did. I did need to stop for a, a comfort break before I got to rugby. Um, and that's the thing that people will say, you, know, you hear people saying about EVs and the criticism is, oh God, you haven't to stop and charge it all the while, but you just plan carefully. You know, you're gonna have to stop for a toilet break or for a picnic or some food or something. So what you do is you plan your charge um, around your food, food and drink stops or your toilet stops. And you know, if you plug your car in and go and do that, by the time you're finished and come back, you've topped your car off enough to finish your journey. Um, so it's all about planning and, and thinking differently. Um, but the, probably my final top tip, um, pack a flask and take your food with you. Um, because one thing you will find is you'll spend more on food and drink when you stop to charge than you will on your charge. Uh, because you're always tempted to go and buy some food and buy a sandwich or go and get a coffee. And before you know it, you have spent 10 quid on food and four quid on charging your car. Um, and uh, certainly on holidays, we've always oh, got a picnic with us when we're on holiday and we take a flask with us. And uh, as a result, we, uh, we sit and have our picnic, have a brew, have a cup of tea. And by the time we've eaten our food and had our cup of tea, car's charged and we're ready to move on. No inconvenience whatsoever. So, so there you go. Um, that's really my EV for beginners. I, I hope you found it useful. Uh, as I say, if you do want to use my uh, referral code for Octopus, I'll put it into the comments below so you can copy and paste it. Um, but again, let me know what you think of the video. Hope you found it useful. Hope you learned some stuff. Um, and uh, all these sorts of things now, they've just become second nature to us. You, you might find that a real overload of information. Um, but to be honest, within a couple of weeks, you'll sort of be doing this sort of stuff second nature and you won't think about it anymore. It'll be just like when you learn to drive a petrol car a couple of weeks later, you weren't stressing about filling up at a petrol station anymore. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you like the video, quick, click like, click subscribe, and I uh, haven't got a clue what the next one will be or when it will be, but we'll see. Thanks a lot for watching. Cheers. Bye.